Welcome to the Thrive TV Show with Lauren Parsons, helping you boost your health, energy, and productivity. Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the Thrive TV Show. I'm Lauren Parsons, your host. And today I'm joined by Alan Joan Nelson, who is a self-proclaimed challenger of the status quo. And we're talking about why working school hours benefits all. So welcome, Alan. Thank you. It is so nice to have you here. So we're going to be talking today about how an understanding of the current construct of work is actually marginalizing many people, especially mums, insights into how work can be structured better to benefit parents and non-parents and organizations, and practical ways for managers and staff to start implementing some of the work school hours principles in their workplace. So before we get into that, can I just ask you my this and that questions, Alan? Absolutely. Nice. So tell me spots or stripes? Stripes. Stripes. Nice. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Okay, cool. A month without your car or a month without the internet? Oh, a month without the internet would be a luxury. I'd love to tap out for a month. Yeah, have a digital detox. Nice. A classic clothes or trendsetter? A uh, trendsetter. Nice. Yeah, very nice and bright today. Singing or dancing? Dancing. Nice. And photograph or painting? Uh, painting. Okay, fantastic. So Dr. Ellen Joan Nelson is an ex-army academic business mum with deep ex expertise and experience in leadership, well-being and the future of work. Following her PhD, she consulted to the New Zealand Army, helping them improve their inclusion and diversity policies and practices, especially around gender. Then she conducted her own further research, focused on the experiences of working parents in the corporate sector, and started the Work School Hours movement. Ellen now helps organisations to remove structural barriers that face women and parents, while simultaneously improving their organisational metrics like well-being, retention, leadership, productivity, innovation, and business performance. So, Ellen, tell me, how did you get into what it is that you are doing now? Yeah, sure. So, as you noted, it kind of started where I did my PhD, which focused on the experiences of women in the workforce. Uh, the case study was the army, but it was uh, about women more broadly. And uh, no surprises, Lauren, there were some findings that weren't particularly uh, satisfying in terms of, you know, challenges that women were experiencing. And I ended up, as you mentioned, uh, kind of doing some advisory type work for the New Zealand Army to help them with this challenge. I thought, you know, they, they publicly state that they want more women. Um, my background, I was in the Army myself. And I thought, gosh, if they knew this information, like, they might actually be able to use it for good and to make some changes. And so then ended up doing some advisory work for them. What happened after that is I got asked to speak at a couple of events about this experience. So it was sort of about, you know, my journey serving in the army, then researching about it and then advising to them. And mm -hmm. when I was asked to speak at these events, uh, the kind of the organizers asked me if I could just sort of focus on the topic that I thought would be most relevant to the corporate sector. Um, by the way, all the, all the topics are actually of relevance beyond the military, but the one that I decided to hone in, hone in on was this one around kind of the challenges of being a working parent, or it was around mums, but it is, you know, it's certainly not just, not just a mum thing, it's as relevant to dads as well. So I spoke at these events uh, about this particular topic, about my, my research journey, and then after that, something kind of interesting happened. So Lauren, all these women, they started reaching out to me, wanting to tell me about their experiences. I guess they thought that I was someone who was interested uh, and, and a writer was. And it started off, it's, you know, it's not a kind of formal piece of research that I could say published in an academic journal, but there was absolutely something in this. And it started, it was conversations with, it was 82 working mums. And these 82 mums were across a variety of different sectors and roles uh, in both New Zealand and also some in Australia. And then it grew uh, because I pretty much, Lauren, just talk to anyone who will listen to me about this. And I've now got sort of effectively data or conversations with more than 500 uh, working parents, uh, mostly oh. mums, but uh, there are some dads now as well. Uh, and this is New Zealand and Australia, but also into the US, UK, uh, Canada and Singapore. And anyway, what I found is that I just kept getting the same story. So... <laughs> 
And um, if you'd like, I can basically share you. Mm-hmm. All of these working parents, they literally fitted into one of three categories. Um, and when I, and I'll tell you what those, those were in a moment, mm-hmm. but it just, they were really uh, kind of frustrating to me that there was these recurring things, and they're not good, right? None of these, these answers I'm about to tell you are particularly great. And so I sort of just started stewing on it um, about there is a real issue. And that's kind of where hashtag work school hours started. Um, mm. So, yeah, do you want me to tell you yeah. a little bit about the findings? Yeah. So what well, I was just going to ask was, so can you just define, like, what is the work school hours movement? Yeah, sure. So mm. it's basically this idea to, I don't know, resolve these findings. Um, and address them. Uh, so the idea that we, our construct of work is effectively nine to five, right? 40 hours. And even roles that are not within that construct, everybody's contract is based on it. So our society fundamentally is based off the nine to five for 40 hours, regardless of whether people actually work those hours. Mm-hmm. And nine to five is not the same as school. <laughs> and when I um, was basically looking at these, these struggles that working parents were having, what I found, Lauren, is that I'm just, I absolutely believe that the root cause of these challenges is that these two schedules don't align. And what it means is that for every single working parent, and I think roughly 80% of the population do become parents, they, and I'm telling you to suck eggs, right? But, you know, for every single day, they're like, well, what do I do with my kids after school? You know, what do I do with the kids during the holidays? And this could easily span out, say, two decades. It's, you know, this is not a short term challenge. And so when I realize this is the root cause of the problem, hashtag work school hours is basically about addressing that. So how do we look to uh, not extend school hours? That's certainly not what I'm proposing. But how do we look at reducing the work schedule uh, to align with the school schedule without uh, reducing salaries? Hashtag work school hours. That's the, mm-hmm. that's the crux of it. Mm. So, and I know that you talked about the key benefits for organizations. So I'm really interested, you know, from that organizational and leadership point of view, can you share, I don't know if you have the stats and the research behind how does this lead to, you know, those better metrics in terms of organisations and better return on investment? Is it just about people working more efficiently to get it all done in a shorter time? Which I don't think the answer is going to be yes from you. But yeah, just how how do people make that happen? And, and what are the metrics behind it that I know you've looked into? Yeah, sure. So there's kind of, um, there's a few parts to it. And the first one is around, There is an argument, absolutely, that productivity can be improved. Um, But as as you alluded to, it doesn't just magically happen, right? So you don't sort of, you know, shave off a couple of hours every day and, you know, magically productivity increases happen. But the the research I have behind this is that, and it's mainly actually piggybacking off the four-day week. So massive credit Mm -hmm. to Andrew Barnes and the work that him and his, well, he trialed it in his organization, Perpetual Guardian. But the four-day week is already getting significant traction around the globe, and it is absolutely proving that you can do what we typically call 40 hours worth of work in less hours. And Andrew talks about the idea of 20% less hours, but the same outputs and the same pay. And that's really pretty close to what I'm suggesting for hashtag work school hours. Mm. Um, the other thing is, through my own research, uh, with the, all the working mums that I spoke with, a large chunk of them, they were working part-time hours, but in practice, they were still delivering the same outputs. So what would happen, um, Lauren, is that they would they'd negotiate some kind of a part-time arrangement where they would say, be, I don't know, like a 25 or a 30 hour contract so that they could you know, do what they wanted to do with their children. And then of course their pay got reduced. So, you know, reduced contract, reduced pay, but their outputs didn't get reduced. So their KPIs, their responsibilities, none of that changed. And so what happened is that these women, they, Lauren, they actually did just become faster at their job. So sometimes they would do a bit of work in the evenings or the days off. But the most prominent thing that I found in this research is that we waste a lot of time at work. <laughs> and there is, there is a lot of room for productivity improvements. And so these sort of women are proving it. You know, they're on 25, 30 hour contracts, but they're still doing the same outputs as their full-time colleagues. So I think... The, the productivity argument is, is basically saying this could be done. You know, there is room. It doesn't happen magically, but there is room for productivity gains. Uh, but then the why else would organizations care about doing this? There's, there's sort of three things. And one is around well-being, which, you know, you're the expert in this space, Lauren. So I'm, 
again, I'm probably preaching to the choir and, and you'll know far more about it than I will, but there is a, there's research to back it up. There is a return on investment on if an organization invests in improving staff. And there's so much research that says that happier staff, less stressed staff make more money for your organization. So that, that is a fact. And so if we could give staff, not just parents, but all staff, you know, more time for our family and personal interests, that would make them happier and, and less stressed, especially for our parents, if they could take away some of that juggle. Um, and then the other thing is around attraction and recruitment of the best talent. So, you know, we're in the great resignation, staff, uh, sorry, organizations are struggling to get the best staff. I just think if, you, if you're an organization and you said, you know what, we are going to, we are going to not make you feel bad about having children. We're not going to make you feel guilty about leaving work to pick the kids up. We want you to deliver value for our organization and we're going to give you flexibility and autonomy to do that as it suits you. You would be mm -hmm. able to attract amazing caliber of staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. You know that I'm on board with this. Right. Yeah, you know that I'm absolutely on board with this in terms of I've always been a, a supporter of flexi working and that well, for me personally, I just find that I get a lot done by doing a power hour first thing in the morning, early morning, and that's something that works well for me and I know that I, I'm in perhaps a unique situation that I get to dictate my own hours but you know for example I think those are the sorts of ideas that lots of organizations are now adopting realizing that we don't need to follow the rigid nine to five and yeah actually I think being vocal and being able to say right I'm off now to pick up the kids I can remember when I was in my first ever management role and one of our management team she was part-time and she would leave and she would leave loudly at 2 30 every day and that was awesome it was really good of her to do and, and I think it just set the precedent and she was yeah really effective in her time and really delivered great value um, in the time that she was there but she she did maintain that great balance and you mentioned that in your studies and in your research and interviews that people fell into three categories I'm really interested to hear about what those categories were and what that signified yeah sure so I mean they're quite depressing Lauren basically there were three and they were so um <laughs> there really weren't outliers and it was frustrating. You know, as a researcher, you're almost looking for the exceptions and they just, just really weren't. So the three categories is, first of all, the parents basically cannot make work work. Uh, and so they leave the workforce. And these were people on quite a spectrum. So we had people that were, say, in a, like a higher socioeconomic end of the spectrum. And so for them, you know, their family or their household had the financial freedom that they could kind of live without that person's income. But then you also have people on the complete opposite end of the spectrum who were, say, solo parents on minimum wage type jobs. But when they talked through the logistics of having to work the hours that were stipulated by the organisation and then manage young children, they were just like, I just, it's not possible. And so they had to leave and be on a welfare benefit. And so, so that's category A, which is, you know, disappointing. People just effectively are precluded from the workforce because they can't make it work. The second one is that they work full time. Um, but they, they talked about the resentment they had, the fact that they missed so much time with their children. You know, they, they had their children in full-time childcare, and, they, I mean, that's expensive, so there's a financial cost, and then, of course, there's the, you know, the kind of the missing factor that they felt that they were missing their children, and, of course, you know, all the guilt that poor parents have loaded onto them. And then category three was the one I kind of alluded to before, where they'd negotiate some kind of a part-time arrangement, but what inevitably would always happen is the boss, um, if the boss was willing to, you know, willing to approve that, it would come with a, yeah, sure thing, you know, just as long as you get everything done. And so she'd still get everything done, uh, but on a pay cut. And I remember thinking, Lauren, because the woman in that third category, uh, the woman in the third category, they always use the term lucky. Like, I cannot tell you how many women said, gosh, I'm so lucky that I get to work for this, you know, this organization that, you know, allows me or permits me to work part-time. Gosh, I'm lucky, so lucky. And then when I kept hearing it, I was like, this is BS. There is nothing lucky about getting a pay cut to do the same job. And so that's, yeah, kind of back to almost where did this come from, Lauren? I was on maternity leave uh, in 2021 with our second child. And I was just stewing on this. I was like, none of these outcomes are good. They're all totally disappointing. And I just reckon we can do things better. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. I can see that you're really passionate about it. Oh, yeah. So, so let's get into some of the specifics. Because I know that you said you wanted to talk about some insights into how to structure work better so that it benefits parents and non-parents and organisations. So how do we do that? 
Yeah, sure. So the implementation is, I think, really important, right? So it's all well and good for me to say, yeah, there's this lovely idea and great in theory, uh, but, you know, I'm pragmatic. Organisations won't give a darn unless they think it's actually doable. Um, so hopefully I've kind of explained why I think there are commercial benefits. If they, you know, change the structures, uh, they will get more out of their staff and that's good for their bottom line. But the, how, do I, how do they do it? There's kind of two main areas. And the first one is quite literally talking with your staff and basically asking the staff and say, hey, look, we're looking at how we can give everybody more time. So not just our parents, everybody more time to themselves. Um, and we want to, and what we do have in our mind is that, yes, we're trying to make life easier for parents because they're kind of a pretty big demographic that's struggling. But we want to make sure this is available for everybody. How can we as an organization still make the same outputs and reduce our hours? You know, how can we increase our productivity rate to still get the same stuff done, but in less time? And people, honestly, or, or sorry, organizations that I've spoken with, they are quite blown away by the creative ideas that their staff come up with. So I don't have this kind of textbook cookie cutter idea for, you know, all the things you need to do to increase productivity. But when staff are motivated, it's really quite amazing what they come up with. And, you know, if you know that you just have to be at work until five, even if you're not, even if you're not a lazy person, there's not really an incentive to do your work faster. You're just like, well, I'm, you know, I'm here till five, so I'll just do my work. But if you know, you could leave at two o'clock if you get your work done, people pick up the speed and they, you know, come up with ideas to be more efficient when it comes to team meetings, all kinds of things. So that's kind of the first thing is actually just mm -hmm. get advice from the staff. And then the second one is around um, what I'd call like phasing. I'm not suggesting that organizations just, you know, snap into work school hours overnight. That's not going to be financially sound. But how do you look at making incremental progress? So basically the world right now, we're in nine to five. That is our current construct. And I, my goal for the world is that we're in a hashtag work school hours construct. But it's a spectrum. And the honest truth is any progress along that spectrum is going to be, it's going to be positive for both the individuals and also for the organization. So some of the things is maybe just look at finishing in time for school pickup, say one day per fortnight, just kind of see how that goes. Um, the other one is around the scheduling of team meetings or co-working periods. So a real simple one that quite a few organizations have actually told me they've adopted is stop setting 4 p.m. team meetings. Just make yeah. the team meetings within school hours. And then within that, it's a real focus on outputs as opposed to inputs. So if organizations and managers can get really clear on what it is that we want our staff to deliver and, they, and therefore focus on that, remunerate that, reward that, um, you know, appraise that as opposed to the hours that they sat at their desk. And mm. that's, you know, it's a win for both. It's a win for the individual because they can be more flexible. And again, it's not just that everyone is now going to work from nine till three. No, it's about, you know, what's going to be best for them. And as you just said, you know, the morning hour is really great for you so if you and I know you work for yourself but if a manager in an organization is like yep we want these tasks done focus more on the tasks that need doing as opposed to the hours that the people do it in mm. I mean it just again we, we're kind of preaching to the converter back and forth because this just makes total sense to me and and I have admired the work of Andrew Barnes you know they say that the average person delivers about 2.8 hours of effective work a day. And so a lot of the work that I do is, you know, is all around how do we boost not just well-being but productivity. Because when we boost both, you know, people can achieve an amazing amount of satisfying work and fulfill that sense of purpose and contrib contribution, which is great for their well-being. So it creates that positive spiral. And I think everyone, you know, wants to come into work to be able to thrive personally and give their best. Another interesting thing that came to mind when you were just speaking, Ellen, is um, Parkinson's law which you may be yes. aware of as well which is that work expands to fill the time available so yeah. I really agree with that idea that you know if work can be structured in a way so that yes team meetings are done within school hours makes total sense and also that we have parts of the day that are open hey let's chat to your colleagues time and other parts of the day that are what I call golden hours where no one interrupts one another so if we know that in our organization between 10 and 11 no one interrupts one another and I'm thinking oh I just want to ask Alan that question oh it's 10 45 I'll just wait till I'll just wait till 11 o'clock it's not that difficult to again experiment it sounds like what you're saying with your phasing experiment and, and introduce these things and I've heard of studies where you know creating golden hours or creating meeting free mornings or meeting free days really boost productivity because people can get in flow and get that 
key ca task actually completed. Yes. So, yeah, really interesting. Oh, and Lauren, I love, um, you actually thought of me, it was a TED talk, and I, I've forgotten the speaker, but he talked about peak flow and time confetti. And gosh, yes. I learned something from that. You're right. Like when your day gets interrupted, your ability to produce things really decreases. So when you just have time that, yeah, you're uninterrupted, you can get so much more done. I remember mm -hmm. like, can you think, of, and I can think of so many people that say to me things like, oh, I just went into work early today so I could get some, you know, so I get my work done. Or I just stayed back late tonight um, when all the staff had gone so I can get some work done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, isn't that a bit of an interesting thing that you, to get some work done, you need to almost not have other people around. Yeah, and that's where I think flexible working and potentially partially working from home for those industries where people can is really beneficial, you know. And, and in almost all roles, there, if, especially in your, some sort of role where there's reflection and development and problem solving and new ideas as part of your role, actually doing that away from the office can be the best time and place to do that. Absolutely. So let's just, I know that you wanted to share some practical ways for both managers and staff to start implementing some of these ideas. I know you started talking around them, but are there any more specifics or ideas for those that are either in a, in a leadership role or in a team role? I think, so in terms of what management can do, I think I've um, sort of covered my main points there. What I would also say on the management side is that this is not just applicable to say people who are office workers or professional services. So even people who are shift workers who, you know, they're not going to work a school hour. They're not going to work school hours. We do actually need our hospitals open 24 seven, for example. But there are even ways that managers in those fields can apply some of these principles. Um, and around, you know, when I talk about flexibility and autonomy is a lot of shift rosters from many industries that work on a shift system, they're very blanket. So I truly believe there is a whole lot more scope for more customization uh, for shifts where you get both staff input and managers can uh, have a part to plan it as well in terms of we don't necessarily need to have blanket shift rosters so that some of these advantages can be seen in those industries. Then in terms of your question, in terms of what are the practical tips for the individuals? So, you know, I don't, you know, there's people listening to this who are not in a management position and think, well, this is, you know, I can't do anything about it unless my manager gets on board. I would say that if they can even have a bit of a mindset around their outputs as opposed to their, to the hours that they work, instead of going to their boss and saying, you know, I'm, I don't know, I'm stressed or I want more time with the kids and basically talking about the reasons why their life is tough and there's lots of fair reasons why it might be, go to the manager, flip it around and say, manager, I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that you want me to do these tasks, A, B, and C, and you want me to do them by this particular date. Manager, I've got an idea for how I can deliver that for you and I'll do it to good quality. What I'd really like to do is work slightly different hours and maybe change my location of work. Um, manager, would you be willing to let me say do this for the next two weeks? And then at the end of that two weeks, we'll have a meeting and you can determine whether or not you think I've delivered for you. Uh, and if you do, I'd like to then make this a more permanent arrangement. Mm, um, that's smart. So it's really, yeah, like reframing it to make the manager uh, know or feel confident that you're going to be doing what they want you to do in terms mm, of that. I like that. Yeah. And it's, I mean, one of the key things I teach around, I talk about communication skills is always picture what's the benefit to the other person, because as human beings, we're all innately motivated by, you know, what's in it for me. So if you're going to talk to your leader, your manager about wanting more flexibility, I, I really agree with that. Go to them with a plan in mind. And it may be that, Hey, you're actually thinking that you're going to do an hour and a half of, focused work first thing in the morning because that's what suits you and I'm, I'm not naturally an early bird but I just just go ahead and try it if you want it's just so good you just feel like you've gotten ahead for the day and perhaps then you do decide to work your school hours and and maybe you do I don't know maybe perhaps you do two evenings a week where you'll work evenings but you get to enjoy that after school time with your kids whatever you think will work with you but again I like the way that Alan you're talking about present it to your leader as I want to have these blocks of focus time so I can just get all the reports done or get all of the inputting done or, you know, finish off that project or rewrite that whole um, policy or whatever the thing is. Mm -hmm. And I think that it will create, you know, again, work expands to fill the time available. So if you have these windows of time, whether that's perhaps done from home or if you have flexibility to be in the office early, all of these things I think are, are good um, variables for people to, to manage with. And obviously through the pandemic, a lot more people have been forced into working from home. And there are also some downsides of that. You know, we need to also make sure people are equipped with um, being able to set boundaries so that 
life and work doesn't all blur and that people do switch off. But I think there's just so much potential for people to improve the way that they're structuring their days. And as you say, for leaders to do this organisationally so that they can retain amazing staff and that everyone can be more effective and productive. Yeah. So we could talk about this all day, (laughs) I'm sure. Um, But if people wanted to find out more about you, Ellen, uh, or to hear more about your research, how can they do that? Yeah, sure. So my website, which is ellenjoannelson.com, and I've got my hashtag work school hours talk on there. Um, I'm actually very excited. I'm talking about it at TEDx event uh, in June this year. Uh, So based on my website, the best place, uh, or follow me on LinkedIn or YouTube. Fantastic. So which TEDx event are you speaking at? Uh, It's the Auckland one. Oh, fantastic. Oh, that is so exciting to hear. So no doubt when you're watching this or listening into this, I'll have the link down below to to Ellen's TED Talk as well. Very exciting. So if there's one final thing you'd like to share with our listeners and viewers today, Ellen, what would that be? It would be that we need to ask more questions of why. So if you're in a situation that's tough ask why are we doing it that way and maybe it doesn't have to be that way Mm, nice and I like the idea of um, phasing things in and and having those conversations asking those important conversations and one small thing I wanted to look back to because you mentioned um, the time confetti and that was just so that if anyone was intrigued about that as well that was Adam Grant's TED talk on languishing where he mentions time confetti which is where you take nice big useful bits of time and you just shred it into tiny little pieces that are useful for nothing so that's another great TED talk to check out so make sure that if you are listening in to the podcast version of this that you head to thrivetvshow.com so you can see all of the links below thank you so much Ellen thank you for your time and your wisdom and I just wish you all the best with this mission and um, movement that you are creating thank you so much Lauren and thank you for having me I was so excited so thank you Wonderful. So that's been another episode of the Thrive TV show. Go out and thrive. Thank you for listening to the Thrive TV show with Lauren Parsons. Visit thrivetvshow.com to access the show notes and discover our fantastic bonus content. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next inspiring episode.